We turn now to session three, which is the uh, four structure challenges. Now, this session is effectively in three parts, uh, concluding with our first of the open forum discussions. Now, we wish to look broadly at uh, what may influence four structure decisions. First, we'll take an outsider's view through the lens shaped uh, in part by a different strategic culture, geography and political context. We've invited uh, Sir, jo Sir John Scarlett, previously Chief of the uh, British Secret Intelligence Service and now currently Senior Advisor of, the, uh, of Morgan Stanley UK to contribute his perspective. Uh, after Sir John uh, will be uh, Mr Ben Hudson from uh, head, Heads uh, Land Systems at Ryan Mattel. Uh, here we wish to frame the technology challenges facing land forces. Now, our armies emerged from nearly two decades of operations, a far more capable but also a more expensive organisation. That technology cost capability balance is not well understood outside of a few experts. And again, we wish to take a, an outsider's point of view of that. Ben's recent experience in Europe offers, I think, an interesting perspective. We'll then hear from uh, Director General of Strategic Plans, uh, Brigadier Dan McDaniel, uh, who will outline Army's thinking on, on the issues. The session will then be concluded with an open forum discussion, and that'll be chaired by the Rector of the University of New South Wales, Canberra, uh, Professor Michael Freider. And to get us started, I'll ask uh, Sir John to, uh, to speak. Thanks very much. Right, well, good, um, good afternoon. Um, I'm uh, uh, flattered and um, intimidated following the Prime Minister uh, just, um, just before uh, lunch. And I was interested um, when he was sort of talking back about history and context and, and so on, uh, he made um, a, a reference, uh, as you recall, to the situation in 1938. And I thought I would just briefly... Uh, mention that at the beginning of what I'm going to say because you know, I'm always hearing in the uh, work that I do now and, and in, actually more now than even when I was um, head of the intelligence service about how we live in exceptionally unstable and unpredictable times and how the global landscape has never been more uncertain and so on. And I'm always inclined to question that because I mean I worked in the intelligence service for 38 years, and I've been dealing with international issues for several years since then. And in my experience, you know, the, well, the world's a complicated place, and it always is unstable. I can't think of a time uh, in my experience or beforehand uh, when it hasn't been. Uh, and you know, I'm once bound to say that last year, after all, saw the centenary of um, 1914. Uh, we heard the reference to 1938, but even in more recent times, and we're attending now, we talk about the Cold War as if it was some kind of predictable and uh, stable, you know, if tense uh, period. But speaking as somebody who, for 20 years, was sort of on the front line of the Cold War, I can just say it certainly didn't feel like that at the time. <laughs> and, and, of course, because now we know what happened at the end of the Cold War, and so, fine, you look back and it's all predictable. Of course it is. Uh, well, I'll come on to that in a minute, actually, um, in case we're going back towards something like that. Uh, but at the time, you don't know that. So the future is always unpredictable. And it's very important to keep things in perspective. That said, the world is, as we've been hearing, you know, becoming a smaller place all the time. It's changing uh, fast. And of course, that means there's a lot uh, to uh, worry about. And I'm just going to start here by reminding us of, sort of certain basic underlying things, features, and so on, which don't always get referred to in talks like this, that's, that are there as part of the world in which you know, we're constantly working. Uh, the social and economic uh, changes which are taking place uh, around us, and there, that is just highlighting population growth, uh, urbanization, middle class growth, with all sorts of consequences for um, consumption, energy, food, and water, and so on, and poverty reduction, really good news, but quite often unpredictable, tricky consequences. 
worth noting, of course, also that these changes and these statistics, which are quite dramatic, uh, are, um, are quite closely linked with the emergence of, uh, of China. And if I just also remind everyone um, of the technology changes again, the, this big global statistics, the one I like in particular um, there in uh, 2015, um, the uh, global internet traffic per year is the equivalent of uh, 15 billion iPads. So we put it like that, an extraordinary change and speed of, um, of change. Um, now I'm going to focus, you know, moving on from that, I'm going to focus um, as an outsider, making comments as an outsider, on you know, what are my key uh, preoccupations. And when I do comment, I'm going to focus on the Middle East, North Africa, Russia and Eastern Europe, and um, East Asia. Uh, I say straight away that, of course, I'm picking those out because in 20 minutes I've got to focus on something and got to prioritise things, and I don't want to imply there's a lot, of, not a lot of other things going on that we also need to worry about as well, and maybe that'll come up in subsequent discussion. Now, as an audience like this, I'm going to assume um, you know, a lot of knowledge, um, and so I'm not going to go into lots of detail that you already know. I'm just going to focus on those points which I think are, are important and it's very much um, a, a personal uh, view. So I'm going to begin, um, as one always does somehow, with the Middle East and North Africa. Um, uh, I'll talk about the rise of IS, state disintegration in Syria, Iraq, Libya, and Yemen. Yeah? That's quite a list already. Uh, pressures on Saudi Arabia, which I've seen myself from personal experience, and then the future position and situation um, as we speak more or less changing around Iran and the potential for interstate tension and, and conflict um, uh, there. And these are the particular points that I want to just sort of think about now. Uh, and um, I'm going to begin with um, IS. It's very difficult to find a map which quite tells the story of, uh, of IS in anything other than a sort of oversimplistic uh, way. But what that one does um, is, uh, you know, at a sort of, you know, in one shot, gives some idea, first of all, of the dominance in territorial terms uh, that IS has established in Iraq and Syria over the past year. It also reminds us that they've taken quite a lot of uh, losses of territory um, in that time uh, as well. Still, there's a degree of territorial control that they have established, which is, pre which is proving maybe more resilient than we at one point expected, although it's a sort of fast changing situation. Um, you all, well, you do have to follow it day by day. We're hearing at the moment, more or less as I speak, about the effectiveness of Kurdish uh, movements and uh, uh, Syrian Kurdish movements in uh, northern Iraq and uh, northern Syria and around Raqqa, and that's very interesting and significant. Uh, but we also are constantly hearing about the difficulty of building up Iraqi army units uh, to push back on the ground against um, IS. And, you know, bluntly, this has not been as successful uh, as we had probably thought it might be, taking back territory. Uh, and the coalition response, which Australia, of course, is a key part of, the UK is a key part of, regional powers too, but very much led by uh, the US, of course, it's complex. And it's clear that we're finding it difficult to anticipate exactly what to do and what to expect from what we do. Interesting a study written just the other day by a former US colleague of mine, John McLaughlin, uh, pointing out that really to have the kind of dramatic effect on the ground that we would need to have, the US would need to deploy up to 20,000, probably more, uh, troops on the ground, which of course they're not going to do. Uh, um, 
and the question is raised. We talk about training, but is training ever going to be enough? And of course, coupled with air power, is it going to be enough? This, as I've been reminded this morning, um, is an army point, of course, at the point about land power. But we have to constantly keep in mind, and we see this problem fighting out, coming out before us as I speak. Now, the next um, slide I'm putting up there um, is designed to show foreign fighter uh, inflows. Again, that's a very complicated subject, um, and I'll just sort of simplify it in what I say by some sort of headline stuff. According to United Nations figures, 25,000, more or less, foreign fighters have joined the jihadis, uh, mainly um, IS in Iraq and, and Syria. It's worth reminding ourselves as we worry about where they come from, we worry about them coming from Australia, from Southeast Asia, we worry about them coming from Europe, and large numbers have come from Europe, but 75% have come from the Middle East and, uh, and um, North Africa. Another key point is uh, that just since the beginning of this year, the pace of arrival and inflow has, has accelerated with approximately 1,000 fighters coming in from outside Syria and Iraq uh, per month. And then, of course, we have uh, the issue of, uh, to worry about of returnees, uh, an obvious threat. We've always worried about that. We've worried about it in the past uh, regarding um, Iraq. It turned out eventually to be more complicated than we expected and thought. And to some extent, that's true again now. At least with a returnee, you've got something, if you're an intelligence service or security service, you've got something to know about and you've got something to investigate uh, and maybe to protect yourself against. You don't always succeed, but you very often do. Uh, but of course, uh, the ones who don't even go in the first place get recruited and, um, and converted uh, at a distance, online or however, that is the new issue. That is the huge preoccupation for certainly people like me and my um, former uh, colleagues and attack planning and so on built up like that can be almost impossible to detect and therefore uh, to, to prevent. And we're learning all the time about the complexity of the motivation which is involved in attacks of that kind. And I'm not sure we really yet understand exactly how that motivation uh, works. And moving on, um, in fact, going, uh, but just going back in slide, slide terms, um, I talked about state uh, disintegration as another big thing that we have to worry about. It, it's a commonplace to say now that, well, Sykes-Pico, 1916 borders, First World War borders and so on, they've gone you know, across the region, particularly between Syria uh, and, and Iraq, and we're going to have to find something new. And I hear that, and I think, yeah, okay, so what is it going to be? You know, what do we think it's going to be like if we haven't got state frontiers of some kind and more or less a continuation of uh, the state structures that have been there since the end of the Ottoman Empire? It's completely unclear what can easily uh, replace them. So that's one point. Another point is that I just wonder sometimes how carefully we're thinking about what's going on in Syria in particular. Um, of course, there's the battle against IS, uh, but there is also the continued dimin diminution of the power and the stability and the territory controlled by the Assad uh, regime. And this is absolutely an objective comment because the brutality of that regime is as clear to me, um, clearer to me than many other uh, people, and I certainly don't want to see that continuing. But we have almost no idea of what's going to replace it. And we talk casually and easily about removing Assad and we'll find some kind of replacement structure. Well, I know a bit about this, and I can tell you, if you remove Assad, you can start again. Maybe that's what you have to do. I'm not saying you shouldn't. That's the reality of the, of the way a regime like that works. Um, <coughs> and then moving on, just a quick reminder here. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. Uh, Libya. Um, it's a tricky one, this, because again, almost as I speak, it's changing with the driving out of IS from Derna just in the last couple of days. And obviously, that's good news. 
potentially very good news, uh, the stranglehold of IS in the vacuum that exists in Libya, and maybe some signs uh, of um, the different militias coming together to push back. But really, the disintegration of the state structures in Libya uh, is a very sobering issue. Um, I said I'd mention Saudi Arabia as well. Um, pressures on Saudi Arabia. I could talk about this for a long time. Um, I'd just make a couple of comments. Uh, one is uh, that, of course, the Saudi state um, has proven exceptionally resilient and has faced exceptional pressures over the last 10, 15 uh, years with a semi-insurgency starting in 2003. Uh, and no doubt, you know, that resilience will come through um, again, but it is under a lot of pressure, including in its eastern provinces and the vulnerability of the Shia population to extremists, IS-led in particular, um, attack, uh, and the risk that they'll turn to self-defense to protect themselves. Uh, and the Saudi authorities are very, very well aware of that. And of course, they're very well aware of the regional issues which are raised for them and others by Iran. Again, that is a subject which is changing more or less as I speak. Very fast-moving stuff, this. It's difficult to do my job, frankly, without you know, reading the media every hour. Um, but here we are, two weeks, well, less than two weeks away from the supposed deadline for the nu nuclear negotiations, and the Supreme Leader makes a speech more or less saying, well, I've changed, I'm changing my mind, and I'm now setting new conditions, which I know perfectly well are quite impossible for anybody to meet. Is this negotiating tactic... Is it uh, a serious pulling back? Probably a negotiating tactic. Remember what it was like back at the end of March when we faced something similar. Um, it's very hard. Uh, it's very hard to be sure. Little doubt that everybody wants an agreement, uh, and maybe I Iran in particular wants and needs one. Uh, but still, you're never quite sure. So many issues flow from from this. Uh, in the longer term, regional tensions, regional risk management, uh, uh, and, um, <clears throat> and then, of course, the implications of the global oil market and, and so on. So even those brief comments just tell us uh, that this is very complicated and very hard to predict. I'll stop there, so I have to move on quickly. And if I can go on to Russia and Ukraine... Now, again, I'm turning to maps. Uh, they're uh, self-explanatory, two maps. And we move on uh, to the situation uh, today. I use maps because these issues in Eastern Europe and around Russia are about territory. And power and influence, great power, respect, spheres of influence is an issue of territory. Uh, if you... And, if you're the biggest country geographically in the world, unsurprisingly, you're feeling, you potentially feel vulnerable regarding territory. It is, I think, quite widely understood now, it wasn't so much a short while ago, that for Russia, the motivation, a key motivation for Putin personally, is respect for Russia as a great power, and who doesn't want you know, to be respected, and its recognition uh, of your right to take key decisions in your sphere of influence. Uh, that is a natural thought process for a leadership of that kind. Um, the trouble is, of course, that's fine, unless you happen to live in the sphere of influence, in which case you might like it not quite so much, and that's you know, the problem uh, that, we, that we face. Second thing we've learned to understand, and we certainly didn't properly understand before, uh, was the overwhelming importance for Russia and for the Russian leadership um, of, of Ukraine um, as a strategic um, interest, um, a security interest for them, which overrides virtually every other consideration and other factor, uh, including, in the short term at least, the development of your um, economy and threats to your economy, and that's the weapon that's being used back against them, of course, through, uh, through sanctions at least partly because there isn't any other way of pushing back. Uh, I think it is worth just saying that if, again, you're someone like me and you're trying to understand this situation, and it's a big preoccupation, is what happens with the Russian economy into the future, into the next year or two, is an absolutely key um, issue. At the St. Petersburg Forum last week, 
the leadership came forward being quite confident and putting a, um, you know, quite an optimistic tone on things. And maybe that's justified because the economy perhaps is showing more resilience than had been expected. But if you look at the statistics, and it's pretty significant, uh, the projected GDP decline probably this year uh, of up to 5%, um, industrial production down, consumer activity declining, real, really serious real income uh, decline, and of course structural weakness in the economy, uh, because it was, it was in problems anyway before sanctions. And at the same time, as you've got all that, you've got major defence expenditure program still continuing within the Russian Federation and being authorised and encouraged by the Russian authorities, a $400 billion uh, program up until 2020, 2,300 new tanks, hundreds of aircraft, dozens of ships, and huge increase in budget, and so on. Um, <clears throat> the interesting point here that again, I'd love to dwell on uh, more than I've got time to do, and I'm not sure everybody understands, is the state of mind that does seem to exist amongst the Russian leadership. There is an absolute conviction uh, amongst the key decision makers that they are the targets for being surrounded uh, and um, even overthrown uh, by the outside world, but of course especially by uh, the United States. And these are personal statements from Putin, uh, from Nikolai Patrushev, uh, the head of Security Council, and from many other advisors. And I'm just going to quickly quote from an interview that Nikolai Patrushev, the head of Security Council, former head of the Security Service, um, made earlier on this week. Patrushev, um, a serious person, um, he was commenting in his interview about how the US, it was the US that brought down Yanukovych in Ukraine. But, he said, the US has quotes no interest in Ukraine whatsoever. They are interested in Russia. They would very much like to see Russia cease to exist as a country. It is, you know, that got attention in the media, not as much as it probably should have done. This is a serious person at the very heart of policy making. He's not some oddball uh, in Russia, and I could easily find uh, quotes uh, more uh, precise and dramatic as that. And of course, that kind of thinking leads to this kind of thinking. Here from General Baryevsky, former chief of General Staff, speaking at the end of last year, when you start to put it into military terms, then it begins to take that form. It can go into military terms very quickly. And if you notice the first sentence there, you see that reluctance to accept that actually the Cold War ever really came to an end. So if you say the Cold War didn't come to an end, it means that you didn't actually lose it. Uh, and there is a sort of fundamental denial there. I served um, and represented my service in Moscow in 1991 to 1994, so I saw what happened on the ground. And I know the intense humiliation and surprise and drama of those times. And of course, the memory of those times has a big influence now. Um, to summarise at the end there, it may be possible to stop this situation, particularly in East Ukraine, deteriorating any further. Uh, uh, it may be manageable. But almost certainly, as a minimum, we face an extended period um, of confrontation. Confrontation which carries risk and expense. But risk and expense, as we can see from current NATO developments and policies, which have, you know, are going to have, even if you're not in the region, they're going to have influence uh, on all uh, major armed forces um, everywhere. Um, of course, NATO can deploy military force far more substantially uh, than Russia can at the end of the day, but this is Russian territory. Eastern Ukraine is really, in effect, certainly in the eyes of Moscow, Russian territory. They have the fundamental tactical advantage of being on their own ground. Third and final subject, because I have to keep moving, what we've already been talking about quite a lot today um, is East Asia. And I'll just move also on. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
uh, those maps are just reminders again of the situation we're talking about around the island chain. Remember, the island chain is a sort of, that's how it looks if you're living on mainline China, always has done. Again, it feels a bit different if you're actually living on one of those islands, and those islands do include Japan, the world's third largest economy, so it's not a small matter. They're not just offshore islands. And then, of course, we have the South China uh, Sea, uh, and the centrality of that is a global maritime route, Five trillion dollars of shipping uh, per year. We've been hearing about the fundamental importance of um, sea and open maritime routes for Australia. Uh, and of course, uh, the stories around the Spratly um, Islands, 2,000 of acres of land added in just 18 months. This is a huge focus of attention here. It's been it's a fundamental focus of attention at the US-China Strategic and Economic Dialogue, which is taking place this week in, in uh, Washington, and of course at the Shangri-La uh, Conference uh, two weeks ago in Singapore, where a number of interesting statements were made. I'm not going to go through them and repeat them, I'll just leave them up there. What was interesting for me to read those statements was the firm nature of the statements made by Secretary Carter. including, of course, about new equipment and new weaponry, and also the firm and uh, rather measured but subtle response from uh, uh, the Chinese um, admiral, the, the deputy chief, the general staff uh, department. Obviously, this issue that you've been talking about and you are talking about is one for the long term. It's there and it's been building since we've seen the confrontations in the East China Sea going back 2010 and, and so on. And as soon as you look to the detail of that, you could see that this was not a short-term uh, issue. If one just thinks about the planning which must have gone in to the Spratly Island uh, development, this is a long-term situation. Uh, it's interesting to read the 2015 Defence Strategy White Paper issued by uh, the government of China, uh, the emphasis on the evolution of security needs away from simple territorial defense towards offensive capacity uh, overseas. I quote, the traditional mentality that land outweighs sea must be abandoned and great importance has to be attached to managing the seas and the oceans and protecting maritime, uh, the maritime climate uh, and um, our maritime rights and interests. It's a perfectly reasonable statement uh, from the Chinese government, given the uh, nature of their economy, given their history, uh, given the maps that I've just been showing. It's a perfectly natural evolution of events. There shouldn't be anything fundamentally surprising about it. But of course, it has huge implications for every country in the region for the United States and the allies of the United States. Huge implications for military strategy, uh, new, uh, and new tactics, and huge implications for political tactics and strategy. I mean, just simply, how does one prevent an air defense identification zone being declared around these new territories? Now, everybody talks about that, but how is it actually going to be uh, achieved? And how is the reassurance um, going to be given by the United States to its allies. And it's, just, and it's not a parallel, of course, to what's going on in Eastern Europe, but one has to note, again, that this is sort of home territory for China. They have a fundamental tactical advantage um, of being almost more or less on their own ground, yet a long way uh, from mainland United States. I wouldn't take the parallel too far, because I'm bound to say that China's approach to this issue is a good deal more subtle than the Russian one, I would argue. Conclusion. That's an outsider's view. It's rather quick. It covers just the big issues. Uh, um, there are, are, of course, others. I haven't mentioned South Asia. There's been a lot of talk about Afghanistan, uh, for example, and it's not possible to say that everything there is going fine, because it clearly isn't. And as somebody who was there more or less at the beginning, 
and saw the investment that was made, saw the initial success that was achieved, knows about the casualties and the sacrifices we've taken. It is some, you know, a little bit anxious making and depressing to see to read some of what I read now. Uh, but if you just think about the scale of what I'm talking about, even allowing for perspective uh, right the way across uh, the Middle East and North Africa, the reappearance of confrontation in Eastern and Central uh, Europe, uh, and then what I've just been talking about in East Asia, we can see that there's a huge challenge involved for everyone concerned, for all significant powers, especially in the region, but most especially for the global superpower, of which fortunately we have just one, the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, uh, Sir John. That uh, brings to a point which is very good for me for the, for the next stage. So the background you've given us is it really shows us the uh, operational diversity that uh, future forces may need to cope with. With your background and the background from Major General McLaughlin, who's outlined the, uh, this morning the moderniza modernisation needs for, uh, for Army, I'd like to talk to you about vehicle technologies for an adaptive land force to bring those together and highlight where technology is today and what technologies we can bring to bear um, to allow Army to adapt to, uh, to future force structures and future operational needs. So you're probably wondering why an Australian uh, who lives in Germany is here talking to you. I've been involved in, in most major armoured vehicle procurements around the world in the last, uh, last decade, both here in Australia and uh, in Europe and North America. Fred's Utility Vehicle, Scout SV, GCV, JLTV, Puma, Boxer, uh, a range of programs. And what I've seen is a lot of the ch challenges that Land 400 faces right now are challenges that uh, other programs have gone through, and they're certainly not insurmountable. Some of those programs, you could say, are failed programs, but I think uh, all of our customers have taken uh, a lot of learning out of them to, to turn the next phases into successful programs. So what I'm going to go through is a, uh, <clears throat> a quick introduction. I'm then going to talk about full-spectrum uh, utility of vehicle platforms, modularity and upgradability, Scalable platform effects that allow uh, uh, commanders, uh, gives, gives, gives commanders uh, uh, flexibility. Enduring partnerships with industry and then a short summary. We'll be flying at, I guess, uh, 50,000 feet in 20 minutes to go into any, any uh, real technical details a little bit difficult. But given that I'm on after lunch, I've included three videos for you, so hopefully they'll, uh, they'll work for us. Uh, so you'll get to see a few things driving around and, uh, and blowing up as we go. So vehicle systems and their vehicle systems life cycle uh, are 25 years plus. Um, Land 400, perhaps longer than that. And what the vehicle systems need to do is be able to adapt as army needs change and threats evolve. And if you take something like Plan B Sheba, even a deliberate change to the army, it can be done much shorter than the procurement cycles and development cycles for some of these military products. So, Vehicle systems need to be able to adapt and evolve as, as requirements change. One of the key learnings, I guess, from the, the, on the German perspective, and I'll talk about it more coming up, is the German army have set their requirements quite high for platforms like Boxer and Puma. And that's provided real operational utility and allowed those vehicles to conduct fifth to, what I would term 5th to 95th percentile operations. So they have high operational utility and they need very few uh, upgrades through life. So what we've seen in the last 10 years is, is adaptation through urgent operational requirements um, uh, to meet uh, urgent needs. And this happens in very short time frames and causes compromises on, on the platforms. And a good one there, I guess, is, is what we did with ASLAV back in uh, 2004 and deploying that into, into SecDet, where it went very quickly in a, in a matter of uh, uh, less, than, less than a month, if I remember, from, from a reconnaissance task to, uh, to doing uh, uh, work in the green zone in Baghdad pr pr protecting diplomats. So the question is, how do vehicle systems deal with operational diversity through their life? So the current solution to operational diversity, or at least the one that's been, uh, been used in the last decade, is, as I mentioned, urgent operational requirements and quick adaptations of platforms, not just here in Australia, but around the world. Uh, causes many compromises, design limits are exceeded, Reliability is degraded, mobility is degraded, 
There's inadequate through life support often put in place with issues of configuration management and training is compromised. Um, and as you can see on the side there, there's ASLAB with Bar Armour, one of the rapid acquisitions that was done here uh, for theatre. Uh, Warrior with its, uh, its uh, theatre entry standard uh, armour system and ECM. And lastly, the Panther, the Iveco LMV. On the right is uh, how it went into service in the British Army and the theatre entry standard is, uh, is there on the left. And you can see some of the uh, adaptations needed, very short notice, and some of the restrictions on the platform, particularly with uh, vision out of the windscreen. So that's uh, what we've dealt with the last 10 years. What's the future? And I guess this uh, perhaps is a, a summary of, of, of some of we've, the uh, information we've just heard from Sir John. So counterinsurgency and regional wars will most likely dominate the next decade. ISIS and Ukraine, we've just heard about. Coalition contributions to global operations will continue in diverse operational environments and conflict in urban terrain will probably dominate with very, very short engagement distances and a low detection threshold, similar to what we heard from Major General McLaughlin earlier. And what that drives is, is AFVs will be required to conduct a range of diverse tasks um, from urban patrol to force reconnaissance. Uh, and that all has to occur in a very disaggregated battle space with no clear, uh, clear front line um, and state and non-state actors. So what are the requirements and implications that fall out of that when we're doing product development in industry? Well, future forces will need to be ad adaptive to cope with the operations in these diverse environments. High levels of survivability are needed, particularly in complex terrain. As we heard again from Major General McLaughlin, sorry to quote you a few too many times, but, but the ability to take a hit and then, uh, then react and win the battle is absolutely key. Soldiers and equipment will need to be able to quickly complete force regeneration and redeploy to new theatres. Once again, we're seeing Army under Plan B Sheba formalise that in the new force structures. Constrained budgets, as we heard from, uh, from the Prime Minister, I don't think the, uh, the budget is, is uh, uh, never-ending, but the, the balance has to be struck, and constrained budgets will drive a focus on life cycle costs. So operational diversity is only likely to increase. So how do we cope with operational diversity on a military vehicle platform? So the first is what I would uh, coin the ability to, to uh, conduct 5th to 95th percentile operations. Really, a vehicle like ASLAV or its replacement, the CRV under Land 400, really needs to be a Swiss Army knife for, uh, for Army. High levels of survivability against threats, both conventional and asymmetric. We talk a lot about, convention, uh, about asymmetric threats, but when you design a platform, you have to consider the conventional fight as well. Mobility optimised for full spectrum operations. It's really key. The, the mobility on a platform is what gives commanders on the ground the operational flexibility to, to outmanoeuvre an en enemy. Um, if you're restricted to, to roads, uh, then you're, you're pretty easy to target. And connectivity to joint assets and coalition partners. We've heard about that this morning as well and the importance of the partnerships that we have. Uh, particularly if, if uh, escalations are over what can be dealt with with uh, traditional Australian assets. Modularity and upgradability, a key feature for platforms considering their life cycle is up to 30 years. The key one for me um, is modular survivability systems. I'm not a C4I guy, but I do do a, a bit of work in, in that area. But C4I is one of those things that has a much shorter life cycle than, than the vehicle platforms themselves. It's one thing to be able to introduce new electronic systems into a vehicle. It's a whole other thing to, to massively upgrade the, the payload of a vehicle, change power packs so that you can enhance, this, enhance the survivability of the platform. So modular survivability is one of the key fundamental requirements at the outset of the, the purchase of a, a, a platform. But I don't want to hide from the, uh, the fact that, uh, that C4I is a very important part of generating uh, uh, the capability. Um, so modular open electronic architectures are required to facilitate technology insertion. Space, payload, power reserves from the start to accommodate these enhancements. The next uh, feature of an adaptable platform is scalable lethality um, to, to give commanders flexibility on the battle force to engage a range of targets. And that includes everything from point non-lethal capability, aerial lethal cap non-lethal capability, right through to being able to destroy hard targets. Uh, Non-lethal systems now are moving to really being integrated on platforms. We saw it in the requirements set for, for GCV. Um, 
uh, it should be an enduring capability, I think, for the Australian Army going forward as well, considering some of the operations we've done in the past in places like East Timor. <coughs> And the last point really to talk about is reliable partnerships with the OEM. It's one thing to, to maintain a vehicle, but given the, the complexity in the systems now and the integrated nature of C4I, weapon sensor systems, uh, and the safety critical aspects, uh, all of this is now driven by software on the platforms. And these platforms can be maintained, but it's very hard to upgrade or enhance them without the, uh, the help of the original equipment manufacturer. So, it's a, it's a requirement that, that both parties work together uh, to be able to sustain the capability through life. And it's, it's those four features that allow the, uh, a vehicle to adapt as four structures change. It's a little bit more on full spec spectrum utility, which will bring us to our first video to keep everyone going after lunch, if the laser pointer will work. So key features of a platform. Complete situational awareness. Vehicles now are becoming uh, land joint strike fighters. So uh, what you can see there is Boxer with the Lance Turret. Lance Turret is, uh, is uniquely aware of its environment. It has full automatic target recognition in the visual, thermal, um, uh, acoustic and laser spectrums. We'll find targets for the commander, um, uh, calculate fire control solutions and then we'll inject them into a battle management system where they can be handed off to other platforms to prosecute. Protection against full spectrum threats. So not just asymmetric threats, which is, I guess, quite popular the last, uh, last few years, but also conventional threats. And having vehicle platforms that can operate uh, when, when perhaps nuclear weapons that someday could be used is, is still important. And you'll find all the German vehicles still have those levels of protection uh, integrated in them uh, from the start. High levels of mobility, as I said, that gives tactical flexibility for the commander on the ground to not be restricted to... Uh, specific routes. Scalable effects, I'll talk more about that coming up, against full spectrum threats. Everyone from laying an IED right through to a, uh, a main battle tank. Optimised human factors. Now this is an important one, particularly in places like the Middle East where you see uh, ambient temperatures um, that the vehicles have to face of 55 degrees Celsius, surface temperatures because of the solar loading in excess of 90 degrees Celsius, and really harsh conditions for humans. And it's the vehicle system that can sustain them and ensure that they, uh, they are, are operating at their optimum uh, as well. And then lastly, reliable and proven in all climatic extremes. This is again this piece about 5th to 95th percentile operations. And the German army in particular, with both Boxer and Puma, have conducted extensive global testing to ensure that the, the systems can be rapidly deployed at short notice without having to requalify things like cooling systems in the vehicle. So the next big theme, and we've been working with Northrop Grumman for about six months now on uh, enhancing Boxer to ensure that it's connected and interoperable, both with joint assets here in Australia, but also with coalition partners. And that the exploitation uh, uh, of, of the full uh, operating picture with both air assets and naval assets allows the generation of force options that you simply don't have with the vehicle itself. Um, sure, you can do small combined uh, arms operations on the ground, but if you know you can access uh, sensors or provide data to, uh, to a joint strike fighter, then you can, you can just access a whole different level of capability. So with that, a short video on uh, a Puma. The reason I've included this is really to show you the, the uh, levels of testing that the German army go to to ensure that operational flexibility. The videos of uh, the Puma infantry fighting vehicle on hot weather trial in, uh, in the UAE. Uh, doing some uh, firing by day and night. Similar testing in Norway in uh, minus 30 to minus 40 degrees Celsius, and then extensive testing in Germany. 
So the next theme that allows a, a military vehicle to adapt uh, through life is uh, modularity and upgradeability. Uh, you can see here on the right, if we work, uh, Boxer, uh, which is probably the most modular vehicle anywhere in the world today. Not only are things like the survivability system modular and, and, and uh, open electronic architectures, but the whole payload on the vehicle is modular, allowing it to uh, adapt in theatre to, uh, to new roles and new needs. So you can see the common drive module in the top right there. And in the bottom, uh, bottom right, you can see Puma with its uh, highly modular survivability system, a fly light, uh, uh, fight heavy configuration that allows the vehicle to fly at about 31 tonnes in an A400M and then fit an armour package that will uh, allow it to fight uh, the most aggressive threats. So the areas that must be considered are payload and electrical power growth, modular survivability systems and open electronic architectures. And sort of flowing on from the open electronic architectures, we're doing some work in Germany now with the German government and also uh, uh, NATO Stenag partners for the NATO generic vehicle architecture specification, which provides open architectures uh, for all, all electronic components on the, on, the, uh, on the vehicle to facilitate upgrade. Specifies electrical connectors, 28 volt power supplies uh, and, and data uh, interconnectivity for the vehicle. And I guess the, uh, the best example for me of um, uh, a system that has re uh, retained operational utility through life is the Leopard 2. I've got a video on the next slide that will show you that. But essentially that platform went into service uh, about 30 years ago with an L44 120mm smoothbore gun, a hydraulic drive turret and moderate levels of protection. And the latest version of that, KMW's A7 version and our MBT Revolution, take that really to a platform that will be viable for another 20 or 30 years with active defence, uh, full hunter-hunter capability on the platform, uh, an L55 gun with, that can shoot an APF-SDS projectile at 1.7 kilometres to deal with some of the new threats that we're seeing in Europe. That's a 30-year-old uh, original design that through modularity and upgradeability is, is, is uh, as relevant on the battlefield today as it, as it will be in another 10 years. The next small theme is uh, uh, scalable platform effects for full-spectrum utility. And I've, uh, I've got a few pictures here for you of the, uh, the Puma turret, um, which allows a commander uh, to engage a range of threats on the battlefield. Everything from point non-lethal capability, non-lethal area defence, the, uh, the 30 mil main gun with the uh, airburst capability, which can even uh, blind the, main, the optics of a main battle tank. Dual missile system, uh, you can see on the bottom right there, with a range of four kilometres in a special armoured launcher that protects the missile. Full hunter killer capability, active defence, and an independent secondary weapon station on the rear of the vehicle, um, allowing the troops in the rear to, uh, to conduct operations as well. So. Uh, uh, multiple weapon systems on the platform. Now, the, the next video I've got for you, which is only a short one as well, is, uh, is Boxer with the Lance turret. Um, the, I've already shown you a, a Puma video. The Lance turret provides similar operational utility um, and, and uh, full pl uh, platform effects.
the last topic I'd like to briefly touch, while not a technology in itself, is fundamental to allowing uh, the technology to evolve through life, and that's the reliable partnership between a customer and industry. So vehicle systems today are highly integrated uh, capabilities, as I mentioned, predominantly driven as much by software as mechanical systems. And the ability to upgrade those soft, uh, software systems really takes specialist skills, particularly when you're talking weapon systems like you've just seen, and the safety cases and uh, safety critical software behind them. Land 400, I think, has taken a good approach with this, with the deed of enduring obligation that, uh, that industry um, are working uh, at the moment. So on our side in, in Germany, Rheinmetall has provided intimate support to the German army in Afghanistan and it's really benefited both parties. The rapid feedback has uh, allowed us to drive material solutions and uh, the last point there, it's allowed us to, to move very quickly into the A1 standard of, of the boxer, which increased survivability in some key areas and, and uh, enhanced some of the operational aspects of the vehicle. It also improves uh, our response and availability of the platform. So in summary, current and future warfare requires vehicle systems that can adapt to diverse environments and threats. We don't know what the future is going to be, and an investment today is required to, to last 20 to 30 years. Vehicle systems need to be easily upgraded, upgradable, and there needs to be an enduring partnership between uh, the customer and the OEM. The bottom line is a highly capable foundation warfighting vehicle system provides operational flexibility for the future. That's all I have for you. Thank you. Uh, sir, distinguished guests, Colleagues and ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm going to speak this afternoon about our, uh, our sort of strategic plans here in Army. And I've been asked to speak about Australian Army's future force, but uh, I'm not going to make a whole lot of predictions, probably not, uh, not surprising to many of you. What I plan to speak about is more about our, our thinking, uh, our priorities and, and the method of determining those priorities and the characteristics uh, of the future force as we see them. I'd say modernisation is as much and probably more so uh, about how we're thinking as it is about how we're physically equipped. And as I said, so I'll really speak about how we're thinking, uh, starting with a comment on uh, recent modernisation, uh, discussing our analysis of the future operating environment and then moving into how we uh, work to turn concepts into capability. In terms of recent modernisation and, and our modernisation journey, uh, I'd start by saying that I view the Middle East conflicts in which the Army's been engaged over the last sort of 15 years or so as a, as a double-edged sword. There is a view out there that this was Army's turn and that this now needs to shift. And whilst one couldn't question that we're a more, more modern force coming out of those conflicts uh, than we were going in, and indeed I was personally the, the, uh, the beneficiary of uh, the, the Javelin anti-tank capability that was rapidly acquired. Uh, Digger Works is a, f a fantastic success. Uh, and indeed the, uh, the Bushmaster protected mobility vehicle is a great Australian industry success story that protected Australian soldiers and enabled operations, I would suggest that that was necessity. The negative of the modernisation through the last 15 years is the perception that this was indeed sustainable modernisation in of itself. As you've heard already today, while deeper long-term projects uh, such as those around tank uh, future protected mobility, digitisation and the like were developed and progressed. The Middle Eastern conflicts prompted uh, a series of tactically urgent, operationally required add-ons that really were necessary to bring the force up to a level of capability that enabled it to operate and protect itself in those particular theatres. And indeed, 
Ben, uh, in that presentation, uh, just then spoke of some of those urgent uh, operational upgrades. Afghanistan tested our adaptability, but it, it didn't prompt deep strategic modernisation designed with a long-term vision uh, based necessarily on future environmental criteria or indeed of a view of how the Army as an arm of the ADF uh, might be employed within developed joint concepts. And in this, I don't at all criticise those who are involved in the process. Uh, it is merely a feature of the environment we lived over the past 15 years. So let me now turn to, uh, to where we're headed going forward. In terms of the future environment, and we've heard a fair bit about it today, uh, but our Future Land Warfare Report of 2014, uh, the Australian Army assessed that the, uh, the future contested environment will be characterised by five key metatrends, again, some of which both the Chief of the Army and, and General McLaughlin alluded to. Firstly, a crowded environment characterised by urbanisation uh, around littoral cities, increasing population density, increasing competition between peoples and indeed conflicts that, amongst the people. Uh, the implications of this for us in terms of the density and, and urbanisation is uh, particular to our amphibious capability development, ISR, advanced uh, uh, people skills and, and ethnic awareness, soldier resilience uh, for unpredictable circumstances uh, and rapidly evolving circumstances, the likes of which General McLaughlin uh, concluded with. Secondly, a greater level of connectivity and indeed uh, almost daily reports of cyber attacks and threats and the expanding use of social media as a recruiting, funding, propaganda, uh, etc. tool uh, about two examples at quite different ends of, of the spectrum. This requires us to be better, quicker, be protected, uh, and to defend our uh, communication systems with redundancy. A greater lethality, and by this we mean uh, high, both high-tech uh, capabilities, but also relatively low-tech but highly lethal tools designed to defeat high-tech and highly protected capabilities, and this requires us to work to survive the first hit. A collective environment, and by this, again, we mean uh, an interwoven environment of government, non-government agencies and organisations, a joint environment, uh, intergovernmental and, and, and multinational actors, which requires us to think hard about our interoperability amongst uh, all the actors uh, within, a, within a space. And lastly, a constrained environment. Pressures resulting from shifting regional and global economies, demography and society. Greater pressure on capability development uh, and increased scrutiny on the legal, moral and ethical dimensions and aspects of conflict. There is unlikely to be an immediate release of funds and, uh, and it's unlikely that the budget situation will get any easier. It requires smart purchases, of equipment with multiple uses. Uh, and indeed, the last portion that I mentioned there, a focus on human performance. So I'll just shift now to how we're cha channeling uh, this analysis uh, and, and other uh, pieces of analysis that we've conducted in the strategic plans area. Last year, we developed uh, Army modernisation lines of effort. And so whilst Army has plenty of concepts, our general feel that uh, internally was that we lacked the mechanisms uh, to turn those concepts into tangible capability outcomes beyond sort of the, the one, two, three or four flagship programs uh, that you're very familiar with. So these Army modernisation lines of effort that were developed last year and have been enhanced uh, and progressed through the course of this year and have further to go, designed to guide development of our thinking across multiple capability uh, inputs and translate, as I said, concepts into capability. They're designed to provide Army with a, a campaign architecture for future force modernisation, uh, inform the Australian Defence Organisation, uh, writ large, inform industry, 
inform academia and inform the Defence Science and Technology Organisation uh, beyond the range of the soon to be released Defence Investment Plan. They've been developed in close consultation indeed uh, with DSTO uh, and indeed DSTO have a, a lead for each of these lines of effort uh, that sits alongside our uh, Army co-lead. They've been informed by existing strategic guidance and, and obviously uh, soon to be released strategic guidance uh, will have a, uh, a significant impact on them. Future operating environment analysis, uh, some of which I've just mentioned, threat assessments, uh, lessons from contemporary operating environments and, and experiences that we've had in, uh, in various theatres, intellectual partnerships with, uh, with friends and, and allies, and also a scan of emerging technologies and concepts. I mentioned that there are six and I'll, I'll just cover each of them now and give you an idea of the sorts of things we're thinking about. Uh, they're broken up into near-term, mid-term and, and, and long-term uh, aspirations. And the six of them are uh, firstly joint land combat effectiveness, uh, human performance, force protection, situational understanding, command and control, and finally logistics. And I'll, uh, I'll go through each of them to give you an idea of their context, because these really do form, uh, will form the basis of conversations that we will have uh, with those agencies and communities that we work closely with. Firstly, in terms of joint land combat, look, not unsurprisingly, it's, it's about improving the combat effectiveness of our combined arms teams through the modernisation of our close combat, combat support and cross-domain capabilities. From the acquisition of uh, new vehicles to enhancing our ability to overcome battlefield obstacles. From exploring the potential of directed energy and uh, non-lethal technologies to ongoing efforts to increase the range, accuracy and lethality of current and future indirect fire assets. From further developing integration of the amphibious force to enhancing our ability to operate within a future CBRN environment. This line of effort will also consider, consider an enduring, holistic and spiral approach to equipping our soldiers. The human performance line of effort. This is about focusing on modernising Army's approach to its people as its most important capability. And indeed we heard the Deputy Chief of Army speak about that uh, this morning. Now I'd say this is a line that we often use. Uh, people are, are our capability and our most important uh, capability. But there's not necessarily been a holistic focus in terms of the mind, body, tools and team uh, that this line of effort aims to bring together. And this is about improving the performance of our soldiers cognitively and physically. Uh, there's a lot of focus on the physical but less so on the cognitive. Such as through the development of human performance centres uh, and combat resilience centres in our land force bases. Now, our special forces have been trialling these initiatives that are designed to fuse cognitive and physical training and preparation. Uh, they embrace the latest techniques uh, to improve performance and, most importantly, resilience. This aims to leap forward in simulation and develop combat resilience upstream of combat experiences. It will consider initiatives from exoskeleton, uh, exoskeletons to cognitive ergonomics, from nutrition to team selection, and from talent development to individual conditioning. It's intended to focus on soldiers as a capability, as I said, with a view to being better physically and mentally prepared and able to outperform, outlast, and indeed recover faster uh, than an adversary. Thirdly, force protection. Improving the protection of our troops involves incremental improvement to physical protection, but also this involves a philosophical shift from purely protecting the individual and the platform to also protecting the freedom of manoeuvre and the capability of the force to achieve the mission. We aim to make our soldiers and our headquarters indeed harder to detect and harder to target through both active and passive measures. Next is situational understanding, which is about, and General McLaughlin spoke about it, about decision superiority. Quicker decisions, quite simply, made faster than adversaries, while uh, negatively influencing 
obviously an adversary is situational awareness. We seek to improve our means of gathering mission essential information through adaptive multi-sensor platforms and advancing air ground connectivity from focusing on manned unmanned teaming concepts to information exploitation and from autonomous persistent sensing through to advanced analytical, analytical tools. We must improve our joint information sharing systems and indeed our interaction in the cyber domain. Command control and communications line of effort is about improving mission command within the force, again to speed up our decision cycle to make decisions faster and indeed better than adversary. Improving the dissemination of mission orders uh, and control measures through resilient networks capable of protecting against cyber attack. And as General McLaughlin described, uh, continuing to work on lifting the army out of the third generation analogue era. And finally, the area of logistics. The focus here is on improving the sustainment of our force through better logistics control, supply and distribution and the improvement of field services on operations. From RFID stock tracking to increasingly automated warehousing functions, from exploring manned and unmanned logistics delivery teaming, through to our concepts for alternate support methods such as sea basing. From additive manufacturing, which is aimed at providing essential commodities at the speed of need, shortening supply lines and reducing stockpiling, through to improving our power and energy production to reduce reliance on bulk fuels. This line of effort aims to enhance a force's operational reach, its endurance, and through that, its freedom of manoeuvre. Yeah, look, in conclusion, there are, there are some lofty and long-term objectives amongst the lines of effort that I've outlined. There are also some very here and now uh, short-term objectives. Uh, and really what I've touched on is a, is, is a top-line view across those lines of effort to give you an idea. As I said, modernisation requires a combination of futures thinking, evolutionary enhancement and the exploration of disruptive possibilities, all with the aim of providing the most versatile, versatile agile, an adaptable force possible within Australia's context. These lines of effort provide a structured path to inject analytical rigour into Army's input into joint force development and future defence investment plans. This has always been important, but I, uh, I'd suggest will become more so under the One Defence Initiative that we'll see what we welcome uh, as a greater focus on capability contestability as projects make their way through the consideration and approval process. Most importantly, they serve to translate the Army and ADF concepts into tangible capabilities to be put into the hands of our soldiers. And finally, they serve as a path to partnered exploration with scientific, academic and industry communities. An Army very much looks forward to continuing to work closely with these critical supporting communities uh, on the modernisation path, uh, some of which I've just outlined. Thank you. I read the other day that we now experience more change in five years than people 200 years ago experienced in a lifetime. And obviously that's a, a very significant driver of the force structure challenges that we face. And that's come through uh, in all of the three presentations that we've just listened to. But what's also come through is that there are some things that don't change. That diversity of operations is a key driver and that innovation uh, is key to success in conflict. So we've got the opportunity now uh, for discussion and uh, questions, and I believe we have microphones. So if I can ask uh, if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question, if you could uh, put your hand up and just wait until the microphone gets to you, and then uh, to uh, uh, say who you are before you uh, ask the question. Uh, if I could ask a question to Brigham McDaniel, please. <coughs> great, uh, great lines of modernisation that you described and lofty long-term objectives, I 
think was your description. It would be useful, I think, for many here to understand how those uh, objectives that are almost uh, nice bumper stickers in some people's minds, how they're translated into tangible outcomes for the force in what is a rapidly changing uh, world. So if we don't do something about them in the next six, 12 months and so forth, uh, we never catch up. So just explain how um, he's doing that, please. Sure. So the uh, really, I mean, what I what I drew on there for the presentation is a, a snapshot of just some of those things mixed across some of the probably the middle more middle term uh, uh, objectives and projects uh, that we're looking at. Some of which also were, were long term, but we've broken it up to uh, short, medium, and long term. Uh, the, the, they have informed our uh, science and technology direction to DSTO uh, in terms of the questions that we're ask, asking and the requests for support that we need in order to develop capability. Uh, yeah, as you know, strategic plans works in the out to the sort of 2035 and, and uh, uh, next, in, next defence investment plan. But some of those things we're feeding directly into uh, the here and now. So in terms of some of the, uh, the, the combat resilience centres and human performance centres, uh, we want to take the bricks and mortar that we've got now, uh, pull together some of the things that exist and probably exist in disparate forms uh, around, say, our health capabilities uh, and, and push them into a, a function that will uh, combine, I suppose, to focus on the, the cognitive and the physical. That's one of the short-term objectives. Uh, the combat resilience is another short, shorter term objective, again, taking the WETS facilities that we have, uh, uh, rethinking the simulation that we use and uh, looking at how we can turn those into a, a leap in simulation uh, that, that gets beyond just adding mortars, uh, simulated mortars to a WETS facility uh, and takes us into a far greater combat realm that will challenge soldiers <clears throat> more in the terms of experiences that they'll, you know, they might have on a battlefield. Uh, some of them will feed into the modernisation area, uh, which is the, the short term or the immediate term function. Uh, but, but as you know yourself, I mean, that's not, uh, that's not a quick process and it's not necessarily an easy process, particularly at a time when you've got uh, the, uh, the broader department uh, pulling together a defence investment plan that we're yet to see. Uh, so there are a, a range of challenges and I suppose while appreciating those challenges, uh, we weren't prepared to let them prompt us to pause, uh, but, but we certainly, you know, I, I wouldn't disagree that there are going to be challenges in the short term uh, about achieving some of the aspirations that we have. So John, my question's for you. I, we're in danger in this audience of being um, a self-fulfilling prophecy um, about the utility of land power. I just wonder whether we might ask you who've had a pretty uh, incredible perspective looking at potentially the utility of land power now for um, the last couple of decades where we've been employed and, and frankly the results have been mixed. Two very long wars, um, arguably uh, possibly one we might call an ugly win and the other one we might uh, struggle to characterise as any sort of win at all. Um, would you be you know, give us your frank assessments about projecting forward and you're a policy maker about uh, where and how and perhaps why not uh, use land power. Big question. Um, if, I, if one just takes, you know, specific instances uh, and situations which are sort of there, leaving aside for one minute whether, you know, they, they sort of should be there, uh, then I would say uh, that what I have seen and my um, experience has been that sort of force on the ground in confronting a particular situation uh, has been critical, really. Uh, so, you know, to take an example um, in the Balkans in the 1990s uh, where um, I was... Uh, back in London, but operational commander for our, uh, our service deployments there uh, 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 in at the end of the 90s. Um, 
and we remember the um, NATO air campaign um, and so on. And of course that was, it took longer than expected. There were all sorts of expectations about what air power could do you know, in modern warfare and they didn't quite turn out to be what we thought. My memory is, and my understanding was, that it was the fact that we were ready and able to deploy on the ground in overwhelming uh, force uh, <coughs> that was the critical difference to the decision-making of the um, Milosevic government. So that was an early, uh, an early point. Um, then, of course, um, in Afghanistan, in the early stages of the campaign, there was an extraordinary uh, display of power, really, across all sectors. Uh, but it clearly you know, depended, at the end of the day, on the ability to deploy on the ground. Uh, now, then, of course, we had the separate issue of being drawn into a conflict and, you know, you could have started it and you could win it, but then how did you hold the ground and win it in the longer term in such situations? And that is very complicated and difficult. Uh, and uh, that's, you know, that's a slightly separate point. Um, <clears throat> I think the point to come out of um, Iraq, and I mentioned the current situation uh, there, and the conclusion that certainly you know, uh, analysts I respect um, are drawing, uh, that our present experience um, with the um, Islamic State is that even sort of overwhelming a high caliber, the highest caliber air power you know, has its limits in dealing with um, a situation like that. You have to be able to deploy on the ground. And it does appear to be the case where it's possible to deploy effectively in the Kurdish areas, then quite quickly a combination of, uh, as is happening at the moment, actually, with the uh, YPG, the Syrian uh, Kurdish movement, combination of effective forces on the ground and air power is having quite quick results. In fact, we may be beginning to see some quite dramatic results, but they'll only be limited to those areas where that combination could be achieved. Um, and uh, <coughs> so there is clearly a lesson there. Uh, I talked about the deployment, which will be acquired of 20,000 troops. I think I'm right in saying that at the height of the surge in 2007 and 2008, in effect, there were over 100,000 US troops deployed. Um, and there was a massive display of force. And it wasn't just a question of winning battles on the ground. It was a very, very complicated political uh, set of circumstances, highly integrated intelligence work and so on, special forces work, which was, um, of course, I saw, and which was highly effective. Uh, now, you know, obviously, uh, there's another issue as to whether you want to be in that conflict situation in the, in the first place. But experience tends to show that we come out of conflicts and we think, we're not going to do that again. Then a few years later, we are doing it again. Now, you know, we have to hope that that isn't going to be repeated. But it happens to be my personal experience over quite a long career that it is like that. So too much sort of self-examination and self-beating up um, might not be might not be wise um, and sticking to professional experience professional observation professional skills and being confident of your opinions because you know what you're talking about and an awful lot of other people who comment on this kind of subject don't know what they're talking about so you know, sticking to that and then holding fast would seem a good idea Colonel Ball, United States Marine Corps. My question is for the Brigadier, sir, specifically with uh, Army modernization and Land 400. Is there a uh, desire or a requirement for an amphibious capability in that replacement platform? If not, why not? <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I'm not the Land 400 guy. The Land 400 guy will speak tomorrow. So it's probably a, uh, a best a question saved for him in terms of the analysis that's been conducted. Uh, on that journey, but uh, it, it is not uh, intended to swim, uh, and the why not I'll leave to, uh, to Ben to, to uh, get into tomorrow. I might ask a follow-up question to, to Sir John. Um, you're, you, you said that um, uh, you have to be careful with navel-gazing. 
do you have any thoughts about effective processes for extracting operational lessons? Um, <clears throat> right, OK. Well, um, yes. In, I mean, clearly, my professional experience um, is you know, very different from some of the ones that have been uh, talked about um, here. Um, <clears throat> and... Um, what I was meaning by the comment that I make there, and I'm happy to repeat it, is that you know, if you've been engaged, of course, in a major um, set of operations, a major experience, uh, with all sorts of new situations and new experiences developing around you, um, and then while, while it's happening, but certainly once maybe it's over and you're moving on to something else, very careful professional examination uh, of what you have done and understanding the lessons from it analyzing it correctly, bringing that forward, and then having mechanisms in place to implement those lessons, clearly that is the right professional approach. I, 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 mean, I Did I say navel-gazing? I don't think I did. That, that might have been my turn. Yeah, yeah. Um, the um, uh, self-beating up, I think, um, or uh, over-introspection, that's a different thing, because that's, a load, I mean, that's meant to be a loaded expression. And so if you come at it, uh, in some kind of agonised way, and say, oh, God, we made massive mistakes, and we've really got to learn from it, and in any way, the political atmosphere is different now, and it's never going to happen again, it's all going to be different. Um, uh, then, of course, you're going to probably reach the wrong judgments because you're starting off from a, a particular position, and you need to start off from a professionally objective and neutral uh, position and just get the facts right. Uh, ben, could I <coughs> pose a question? We've heard about the tempo of the change in the environment. Uh, the question is whether industry and technology are able to keep up with that tempo, and if so, at what cost? Um, yeah, good question. So uh, the standard planning cycle for me in, in, in our business, uh, product life cycle, is around seven to eight years. So uh, um, we need to either, the platforms we have, we need to either replace or substantially upgrade in that seven to eight year life, life cycle. And we, we fund and invest uh, uh, in that. But, but what you, I guess you've seen in the last 10 years is, is a, a rapidly adaptive threat um, uh, using very cost-effective means to counter very high-end capabilities that we have. And I think it really is fair to say that industry has struggled to keep up with that threat in particular that we've seen in the, in the Middle East and Afghanistan. The Germans, I guess, have coped with it relatively well with a vehicle like Voxer because the, the platform requirements were set at a pretty high level early on. So it performed quite well in Afghanistan uh, against those threats. Um, so for me, one of the, the, the key ways to, to, uh, to adapt is, is to focus your requirements at the start to where you think that they will be later on, as best you can. I mean, the future is unknown. Um, but I think Puma, as well, will be a, a good system for the German army because it's been pitched at a, a quite high level, so they can adapt to those, uh, those threats easier than other platforms. Toby, speaking from Aspen. Um, so, John, you spoke very eloquently about uncertainty and complexity of the current strategic environment. Um, very simple question. I was wondering which element of that uncertainty keeps you awake most frequently and why? Um, okay, well, th this, of course, is a, um, is a subjective, uh, personal uh, view. Uh, two big sort of th thoughts in my mind, if you like. I mean, one is uh, the sheer dynamism, complexity, uh, uh, and impact and importance of everything going across the Middle East we, and North Africa and the Gulf. And we say the Middle East. I think I'm right in saying that Middle East was a term which came from so pre-1914 British headquarters in Cairo. But some genius thought of calling it you know, Middle East headquarters and the thing's stuck ever since. Of course, it doesn't really uh, tell you exactly what the, the rate is. Really, North Africa, the Levant, and Gulf. You're talking about three connected but different regions. Uh, and the, the, what's going on there, as I tried to say, uh, I mean, is pretty extraordinary. And 
I mean, just has obvious implications for everybody, however far away you might be from it. I know there's debate here about the relevance or not for Australia, and I was wondering how much I should speak about it uh, coming here uh, to Australia, uh, but having heard what's being said, and then thinking, of course, about the implications both um, in security terms, you know, uh, uh, on the sort of terrorists and extremists and jihadi front in a globalized world with the technology we were just talking about, the 15 billion iPads and so on, of course, you know, there's no such thing as being very far away at the end of the day. Um, but then uh, other things, and I alluded to it, could have talked about it much more, the oil price impacts and so on. Clearly, the politics in the Middle East really matter. It's a shame, but they do. Uh, that said, maybe because I spent 20 years as a Cold War person, uh, you know, what's you know, the potential implications of uh, Eastern Europe and the development of Russian policy in really, you know, we're only beginning to come to terms with that and to think it through. And that's, what I, that's why I tried to highlight some of the statements that are being made and the thought processes which lie uh, behind them. Uh, they carry an escalatory risk and danger, thinking like that. So if you respond to them through your deployments or whatever, uh, then of course, you know, you run the risk of just upping the ante. But if you don't respond to them, what happens then? Uh, you know, there isn't an, an easy answer. So I fear uh, that it isn't going to settle down. And obviously, since I live rather close to it, you know, that matters. That uh, brings us to the end of this session. Uh, the next session starts at 4 o'clock. Can I remind everybody to be back in here ready to go before that? And could you join me in thanking our speakers one last time? Thank you.